Hello, congregation, family, and friends. I pray that all was well with you. Welcome to this broadcast. We are here on a Friday evening. Uh, normally, we're out here on Thursday evenings, but we had another uh, commitment that we had to do last night, and so I didn't want to miss our broadcast, so I came out here on Friday night, and I hope you can join us, uh, whether you're watching this live or on a repeat. This week, we've been talking about faith, different aspects of faith. We started looking at Hebrews chapter 11, and we looked at some verses there uh, earlier in the week. And then we also discussed in our Bible study on uh, Tuesday night, what is mustard seed faith? And we started looking at that topic, and we're going to be continuing that next Tuesday night in part two of that particular series. What I wanted to talk about tonight was our pillars of faith. Do we have pillars of faith, and what in the world am I talking about? Well, I titled this message, Two Pillars, and if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be looking at a portion of Scripture, just a few verses, in Exodus chapter 13. This is during the trip in the wilderness, and something extraordinary happened to the Israelites while they were in the wilderness under Moses' leadership. So if you have your Bibles with you, or if you are taking notes, I'm going to be reading from Exodus 13, and I'm going to be reading verses 21 and 22. Here's what the Word of God says. The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light that they might travel by day and night. He did not take away the pillar of cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. Now, as if you've read Exodus, and I trust that you have, when the Israelites, they were in the wilderness for 40 years that they were wandering in the wilderness under Moses before they could come into the promised land. While they were there, now here's something interesting. The Bible does not tell us how long the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud was there with the Israelites. There's not a portion of scripture that I've ever found that says, here's where it gets cut off. I surmise that it would cut off once they got into the promised land because they were already where God wanted them. I think that's when the manna stopped and that's when the quail would have stopped when they actually got to the promised land. But again, that's kind of speculation and we don't like to do that unless the Bible clearly tells us something. But it is interesting that God set up two pillars, two pillars for the people. Now, this is something extraordinary. Now, remember, Moses had gone into Egypt and had rescued his people from Pharaoh and they came out. Remember, and the sea was parted, and they came across on dry land, and then the Egyptians were following them, and Moses, with a wave of his, of his stick, of his staff, the water came crashing down over all of the Egyptians. So the Israelites had seen miracles already, and God working in their life. Their faith had to have been strengthened. And yet, as you read through Exodus, how many times do they complain to Moses, why did you bring us out here so we could die in the desert? We're dying of thirst. We're dying of hunger. We would have been better off in Egypt. And Moses had to put up with a great deal of abuse from the people. Read the book of Exodus and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. You're talking about some people that were under God's care, under his provision, under his leadership, and they were still complaining. What did it say about their faith? Not only in Moses, but their faith ultimately in Jehovah, their faith in God. What does it say about that? What does it say about our faith when we question God when he does things in our life or doesn't do things in our life? When a prayer is answered or not answered, when we're praying for a miracle and it doesn't happen, when we're praying for getting out of a financial situation and it doesn't happen, when we pray for someone who is sick and they don't recover, what does that tell us about our faith? Well, God clearly says in these two verses that he set up two pillars and the reason he did that to show that he was present with his people at all times. And so during the day, there was a pillar of cloud. And whenever that cloud moved, read the Exodus account, whenever that cloud would move, the people, they automatically knew they would pack up their things and they would follow the cloud. And when the cloud stopped, that's where they stopped and set up camp. And they did not move unless the pillar of cloud moved or the pillar of fire moved. They were obedient. What did it show them? What did it show us? That God is always with us. 
God is constantly with us. Now, today, I don't see a pillar of cloud around or a pillar of fire, so God lets us know where he is. We'll get to that shortly, because I'm going to tell you and show you exactly what the pillar is today. It's not a pillar of cloud, and it's not a pillar of fire. You may already guess what I'm going to say. But here we have two clouds. And if it turned nighttime, then the cloud changed. Imagine the miraculous thing that they saw, the miracle that they would see. Now, what is a pillar? A pillar is like a column. It's a column. We don't know how big it was. We don't know how wide it was. We don't know how tall it was. What we do know is it's a pillar. It was a pillar. And so the, uh, my guess is that they could look all the way up and down this thing. It was big enough for all of the people to see that God was with them at all times. Can you imagine just this, this pillar that's circling around with these clouds inside of it? And then when it got dark, it changed over to fire because sometimes they were on the move at night. And the Bible says here they did this so that they could move day and night. What is that teaching us? When God tells us to move, we are to move. When God tells us to do something, instructs us to do something, where is our faith? Do we go and we say, yes, Lord, I know that's what you called me to do. Or yes, I'm getting convicted that I should move to a different area or start a different job or marry a certain person or, or volunteer for something, whatever the case may be. And I've shared my testimony with you several times before of how I wound up where I currently am right now. But how many times has God brought that pillar into your life and was guiding you somewhere? taking you somewhere and you didn't follow you didn't follow god's leading you didn't follow his conviction maybe someone came to you or has been praying to you maybe someone came to you with an offer and you felt like it was a good offer so you go to the lord in prayer and you don't receive any kind of negativity from god and yet you're still afraid to go ahead and do it maybe god led that person to you for that business opportunity or for that marriage or for that new position at work i mean god works in all kinds of ways we know that across every area of our life but if we are not watching out for the pillar in our life if we're not being obedient to the pillar imagine the israelites if god decided to move the column and they didn't go what do you think would have happened to them because they were following god was leading them on a specific path he had his reasons god always does but he made sure that even though they were in the wilderness even though they were far from the promised land even though they were in a different area than where they were hoping to be even if they were in an area where they felt that they were dying or they felt that maybe god didn't care about them anymore god was always with them constantly day and night do you have that kind of faith can you say you have the kind of faith that you know god is with you day and night even on those times that maybe you think he's not in your life because we don't see a physical column we don't see a pillar we don't see something where God is manifesting himself in some sort of physical way. Our walk has to be a walk of faith. So where is your faith? Do you have faith that if God, if you were one of these Israelites and God was on the move, whether it was day or night, would you have the kind of faith to follow a column of, of cloud or a column of fire? Would you have that kind of faith? Or would you hold back and say, what is this strange thing that's happening? Would you be one of those complainers that went to Moses and started complaining about him? Listen, <laughs> this is unbelievable. I, I, I need to share this with you because right after Exodus 13, we have Pharaoh that's obviously in pursuit of the Israelites, right? Okay. And so listen to this. In Exodus 14, in verse 12, the Israelites said this, is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt saying, this is them to saying to Moses. Let's go back to verse 11. Then they said to Moses, th these are the, the Israelites, all right, as the Egyptians were marching after them and coming close to them. The sons of Israel cried out to the Lord. Verse 11 of Exodus 14. Then they said to Moses, is it because there were no graves in Egypt 
that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we spoke to you in Egypt, saying, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Did you hear that? You go back and read that again. Exodus 14. This is after God has established the pillars. God is with them at all times. God is leading them. And yet they still complain because they see the Egyptians coming after them. And they're afraid. Where is their faith? They're suddenly afraid of the Egyptians. Now they're afraid of them, which is kind of interesting. They become frightened in verse 10. And yet by verse 12, they're saying to Moses, you should have left us there. Now, what is going on here? They're afraid of the Egyptians coming after them. And yet two verses later, they're saying to Moses, we would have been better off had we stayed there to serve the Egyptians than you bringing us out here to die in the wilderness. They are coming after the servant of God, Moses himself, who was handpicked by God to go back into Egypt, get his people, bring them out. And because they're in the wilderness and they're not getting their way or everything is not being provided to the level that they want, now they're going to come after Moses, God's servant Moses, and they're going to give him a hard time. And they're going to start saying to him, didn't we tell you this in Egypt? Leave us alone. But no, you brought us out. And now we're out here in the wilderness and you brought us out here to die, didn't you? Well, wait a minute. They're saying this to Moses right near or right in front of or within view of this column of smoke and this column of fire, these pillars that never go away. God is right there with them. They've already seen miracles. They've already seen what God can do. And yet, where was their faith? Their faith was weak. Their faith was almost non-existent for them to have to come after Moses, for them to go after him and yell at him and scream at him like this. They said to Moses, verse 11, is it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? You shouldn't even have to ask a question like that. If you have faith in God, if you have faith that he is guiding you, the pillar, the pillar, the column of fire, the column of smoke. Why have you dealt with us in this way, bringing us out of Egypt? Really? Because it was God's will. And remember, the 400 years they were in Egypt, what did they do? They complained. Save us. Get us out of here. They complained under their heavy labor. And now they're asking, why would you get us out? Verse 12. Is this not the word that we spoke to you while we were in Egypt, saying, leave us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? You can read about that in Exodus 6. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Are you serious? Are you serious? Do you think it would be better to be in bondage to Satan, be in bondage to your sin? And I'm asking you and myself today, do you think it would be better than serving God to be caught in your own Egyptian area, for you to be caught in the clutches of Satan? in bondage, in sin, subject to the things of this world, as opposed to following God in whatever way he's leading you. You have a choice. I have a choice. We all have a choice on this side of the grave. We all have a choice as to whether we are going to follow God or not follow God, whether we're going to accept Jesus or not accept Jesus. We all have a choice, and we all have the same choice, and we're all given the same choice. And it amazes me that after everything that happened, here's the Israelites complaining to Moses. And you know what? This is not the only time in the book of Exodus that you see them complain about Moses. Read it. Exodus is 40 chapters. Now the last 20 or maybe 18 chapters of it talks about building the tabernacle and so on, and it gets into great detail. But if you read the first 20 to 25 chapters of Exodus, you will see the whole story. From the time that Moses is called to the time that they're in the wilderness as they're heading towards the promised land. 
And you will see how many times God has fed them with manna. And he fed them with meat, the quail. And he fed them with water so that they wouldn't dehydrate. That they would live in that wilderness for all those years. God provided for them. And he was there in the, in the form of two pillars. Two pillars, fire and cloud. He never left them. He never left them. And yet, they couldn't see past those pillars. They were thinking of themselves and not what God wanted for them. How often are we guilty of that? How often do we think we know what's best for us? God doesn't know what's best for us. God is way out there. God is on the other side of the world taking care of a problem. He doesn't care about me. God wants, doesn't want to help me. He wants to help somebody else. How many times do we have those like that? Where is your faith? Where is my faith? When we have situations and we don't seek God. Now, you may be asking the question here. You know what? Before we do that, if you uh, have your Bibles or you're marking it down, there's a verse in Nehemiah chapter 9 that talks exactly about this, this pillar. I want to read it to you. It's in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 19. Listen to this. And here you'll know the reason why God did this. It says, you in your great compassion did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day to guide them on their way, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they were to go. Did you hear that? This is Nehemiah. In Nehemiah chapter 9, he is going through the various things that the Lord had done for the Israelites. I want to read 19 again. He says, you, he's talking to God, you and your great compassion, God was with them because he cared about them. God is with us because he cares about us. Where is our faith when God is reaching out to us at all times? In his great compassion, he did not forsake them in the wilderness. And guess what? If you're in a wilderness right now, God has not forsaken you in your wilderness. And I can tell you as a personal testimony that I have been in the wilderness in my life many times. I'm actually going through one right now right now in the last few weeks it's gotten worse and worse but i know because my faith is strong that god is with me even in the wilderness it's one of the reasons i'm bringing this message tonight because if you're in the wilderness if you think that god doesn't care if you think that he has no compassion on you and he doesn't love you and he's just going to abandon you because you're in this dark place or you're in a wilderness or maybe a prayer hasn't been answered or maybe you're feeling a little ill Maybe you have a sickness and you haven't been healed yet. Whatever the case may be, where is your faith? God never leaves us. And so I want to look at the rest of this verse here. He says, you in your great compassion did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not leave them by day. That pillar of cloud was there for every hour of daylight. It never left. It says to guide them on their way. Remember I told you earlier, when the cloud moved, the people moved with them. When the cloud stopped, the people stopped. And they did not move again until that cloud moved. Then Nehemiah goes on to say, nor the pillar of fire by night to light for them the way in which they were to go. If God wanted them to go at night, you're not going to see a cloud in the, in the pitch black of night, but you will see a column or a pillar of fire. And when they saw that move, they were to move again. God was guiding them every step of the way. Yet we see time and again in Scripture how many times, not just in Exodus, all through the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament. You and I have seen it these days. People forget or refuse to acknowledge or don't believe that God is always with us. Did Jesus not tell us? I think it's in Hebrews 13. Let's go over to Hebrews 13. I think you probably know the verse I'm looking for here. Hebrews 13. What did Jesus tell us? He told his disciples and he told us the same thing. It's a promise that we can keep. This is one of the pillars that I want to talk to you about of modern day today. Listen to this. Jesus said in Hebrews 13 verse 5. It said, he himself says, I will never leave you or desert you, and I will never forsake you, so that we may confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Jesus 
I asked earlier and I said I would explain to you, we do not have physical pillars today. We don't see a cloud, a pillar or a column of cloud that turns to fire at night. That was a manifestation of God during the time of the Exodus. That was something that God did then for the Exodus. But where is God now? Do we see manifestations? Do we have extraordinary things like columns of fire and things? Does God operate in that way anymore? Well, God, first of all, can do whatever he wants to do whenever he wants it. But I submit this to you. If you're wondering, well, Thomas, what are our pillars today? What can we really count on? What can we really look at the same way to get on those, on those times that we're doubting, those times that we're hurting, those times that we feel like God has abandoned us, those times that we, we feel maybe we sin so greatly that God has no forgiveness for us, he wants no part of us. How do we tap into that faith that we need so that we can experience that ever-present manifestation of God. It's not in a pillar of cloud. It's not a pillar of fire. It's right here. It's what I tell you all the time. It's the Word of God. See, the Word of God is everlasting. The Word of God is unchanging. It does not change. It never has changed. It never will change. Jesus himself said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. These are his words. Jesus is eternal God. Jesus wrote the Bible. And Jesus is telling us right here in Hebrews 13, 5, he said, I will never leave you, never desert you. That's his way of saying, I'm still that pillar of cloud in the day, and I'm still that pillar of fire at night. I've never left you. I will never leave you. No matter what you do, no matter where you are, no matter what situation you're in, we can cry out to God, we can cry out to Jesus, and he's there because he promised he would never leave us or forsake us. So when you need a pillar, when you need a foundation, when you need a place to go instead of complaining, where do we go? I'll tell you where I go, right here. I go right to the Bible because God's word never changes. And what God said then is what he says now. And I can rest on the fact that Jesus said, I will never leave you, Thomas. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will never just turn my back on you. We, as human beings, we have free will to turn our back on God. God, because he loves us, because he sent his son to die for us on Calvary, does not have that same luxury, does he? Can God turn his back on us if he's reaching out to us and he's drawing us to him? Some people will respond to the gospel and they'll become saved. They'll become children of God. They'll get the assurance of eternal life and forgiveness of sins. Other people will hear the gospel and they will reject it. But God's not doing that. We do it to ourselves. So I ask again, where is your faith? Particularly when you're going through rough times. See, our faith is real easy to proclaim when things are going well, when we have plenty of money to pay our bills, when we're in good health, our marriage is happy, our children are healthy, we've got a great job, maybe there's a pension waiting. Whatever the things that are happening that are important to you in your life, when things are going well, our faith soars, doesn't it? Everything's going great. Oh, yes, I have faith in God. God's a wonderful God. What happens when times get tough? What happens when the bottom falls out? What happens when you lose your job? You wind up in divorce. Your children get sick. Maybe one of them died before you and you have to hurry your child. All kinds of horrible things in this world happens because we live in a fallen, sin-cursed world. We live in a world that's not going to last forever. God is going to destroy this world. He's going to build a new heaven and a new earth where all of these sorrowful and terrible things will never happen again. But in the meantime, when things get rough, when things get challenging, where is your faith? Where are your pillars that you look for? I look to two things. Number one, I look for the word of God. And number two, it's my faith in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. They are my two pillars. Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior who saved me from an eternity in hell because I placed my trust, my heart, my soul, my very life, my very breath in Jesus' hands. That's my first pillar. And the second pillar is what he wrote in his book. And it's not just because I was called to preach. It's not just because I'm called to pastor. 
a church. It's because this is my pillar. This is my column of smoke and my column of fire. And when I need to praise God or seek an answer or find an answer to a solution or just go to him in prayer, whatever the case may be, I go to the word of God and I go to my Lord and Savior. They're my two pillars. What are yours? Do you have any pillars, let alone two? Is Jesus, would you consider Jesus Christ to be one of your pillars? Is the word of God one of your pillars? Because we no longer have that manifestation, but we do have the promises in his word, the promise of eternal life, the promise that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. So where's your faith? Where is your faith tonight? And what are your pillars? I gave you mine and I pray that you have pillars. I pray that the two pillars that I mentioned that are mine are yours also. And maybe you have even more. I know what my two are. And that's what I base everything on. Every decision I make, everywhere I go, everyone I associate with, everything is judged by Jesus and his word. Because I need to have the right foundation and the right amount of faith to be able to navigate this world. Let's face it, this world is scary. This world is scary. There's a lot of weird, crazy stuff that happens. And it's only getting worse as the devil is loose and all of his minions and all of the things we hear about every day in this world. It's heartbreaking what we hear. Yet we know that through all of that, Jesus said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's my pillar. That, his word. They're my two pillars. I pray that you have at least two pillars, if not more. Thank you for uh, joining me for this message. If this has blessed you in any way, please feel free to share it. God told us in Isaiah 55, 11, he said, my word will not return void. It reaches all those people I intended to reach. So if it reached you, if it meant something to you, if you know someone that's having an issue with faith, or would need to hear a message like this, please share it. This is the word of God. This has nothing to do with me. This is God's word going out. Please share it. And also I would ask you, as I always say, be a Berean. Acts 1711 tells us that the Bereans were more noble than others. They weren't smarter, nicer looking, or richer. Here's what they were. Their minds and their hearts and their souls, they were open to the word of God. They received the word that Paul was preaching to them with all readiness and eagerness. And that would have been good enough, you think, just hearing it? Well, no. Here's what they had to do, and here's what you and I need to do. They took what they heard, and they searched the scriptures daily, their pillar. They searched their pillar, the scriptures daily, to make sure what they were hearing was true. You need to do the same thing. I need to do the same thing. And it doesn't matter whether you're watching me, someone else, someone on Christian television, listening to someone on radio, someone on social media. Maybe you go to a church. Maybe you belong to a Bible study. Maybe you're reading the latest bestseller from the latest Christian author, whatever. Here's what I'm saying to you, and you owe this to yourself to do this. Every time you hear a sermon, every time you go to a Bible study, every time you read something that has to do with the Word of God, you need to write down the main points, write down the references, and then check that out for yourself to make sure what you're hearing is true. You owe that to yourself because if you don't know what the truth is by searching the scriptures, then anybody can get anything over on you. And I want to tell you that I've seen many people, particularly on social media, just saying the most outrageous things, things that have nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ, have nothing to do with the Bible, popping off prophecy after prophecy or encouraging you to sow a seed or something. So, you, you know, you pay for something and we'll give you something back. All kinds of stuff that has nothing to do with the Bible. Be very, very discerning. Very careful. I have to do it. You have to, I block people almost every day that come with blasphemy. It's not because I know the Bible all that well. It's because as well as I know it, I can recognize when someone is trying to put something over on me or they're just out and out saying things that just are not true. Please, if you've learned anything from me, and if you learn nothing else from me, learn to be a Berean. Would you please pray for this ministry? Our website is livinginharmonyministries.org. Livinginharmonyministries.org. 
as you can imagine, a ministry like this is under attack all the time. Uh, because if you're just joining me, I tend to be pretty loud and kind of, you know, forceful. Because I believe in what I'm preaching. I don't hold anything back. If you're looking for a preacher to preach a sugar-coated, feel-good, no-conviction kind of message, this is the wrong channel. I'm the wrong preacher for you. But if you're looking for the Word of God just shared honestly, exactly as God gives it, no sugarcoating, no tap dancing around here except every verse that God wrote is important. Every verse. And so that is what we're going to be looking at, every verse, as God allows. But we need your prayers that I would stay strong on the front lines, no quit, no retreat, no backing up. This ministry has been under attack for a while. And we're at the part now where we need to restructure some things. So please pray for us that we can continue, not only on social media, but also in local pulpits, traveling where God has us, sharing the gospel, doing all those things that God called us to do. You can see some of those right on our website. And lastly, if God leads you, and God leads you to support us financially, we sure could use your help. We have uh, lost a great deal of support, almost all of it at this point. And I'm just being honest, you know, um, but this is between you and God. If the ministry has blessed you, Please feel free to uh, contribute financially if God leads you. You don't have to pay for any kind of prophecy here. You don't have to sow a seed. You never have to give a dime. But if God leads you, you can do it right through our website at livinginharmonyministries.org. You can also do it right here through Facebook Messenger. It's quick, it's easy, it's safe and secure. Or if you want to mail something in, we do have a corporate mailing address that we can give you if you contact me privately. And we'll give that to you and you could send something in. But again... If you never do that, we still ask for your prayers. And we still ask that you come back and see us as often as you can. I'm out here four or five times a week on average. Love to see you come back. Please mark down where, however you alert yourself that we're on. And we would love to see you. Please pray for us because we have to downsize. I mean, we're not a huge operation as it is. But there's no, there's no big salary here. This is a, a walk of faith. There's income from, from other ways. But um, we'll have to revise our broadcast schedule to find other sources of income in other areas. So I, just, I believe in just being honest with you. But that's up to, between you and God. I want to thank you for being here, especially on this Friday evening. I know it's the beginning of a weekend for some of you. If you watched it live tonight, thank you for being here. If you're watching this on a replay, I pray that you will be blessed and have been blessed by the message. Share it. Let's get the word of God out. And we'll see you soon here on the program. God bless you.